So today we're going to talk about calf strains, Achilles tendonitis, and even Achilles tendon tears or ruptures. Many of you watching this may have sustained one of those injuries throughout your life, or maybe one of your favorite athletes has sustained one of those injuries. Now, those of you who follow us obviously know we're going to go over the anatomical awesomeness regarding these injuries. However, today we're going to do something a little different. See, I'm a huge NBA fan. And the other day I was reminded of a specific NBA player, Kevin Durant, actually sustained two of these injuries in last year's playoffs. Kevin Durant sustained a calf strain in the playoffs, and then four weeks later or so, he sustained an Achilles tendon tear or rupture. Now, this was a hugely debated topic in the sports world. Did he return from the calf strain too soon? Did the calf strain relate to the Achilles tendon tear? So we actually have a couple of clips from ESPN on a show called First Take where they debated this topic. So go ahead and take a look. So in other words, somewhere along the way, if you're making that proclamation that the wrong information was given to KD, mm -hmm. that's an entirely different thing than saying, excuse me, you know what? How could you not know it was an Achilles? There's plenty of doctors that'll tell you. One has nothing to do with the other. Whether they're connected or not, they'll tell you. The calf is the calf, the Achilles is the Achilles. Don't pair the two. That's what they'll say. So, they have... so there you saw Stephen A's take. The calf is the calf, the Achilles is the Achilles. Don't pair the two. Is he right? Well, let's first see what Max had to say regarding this. The, the, you're telling me it's a calf, not a... Let's say you're wrong. Perk, let's say that it's it really was the calf and not right. the Achilles. I agree with you. It looked like an Achilles to me off right. of that, right? But let's say it was a calf. <laughs> the calf and the Achilles are right there. Now you want me to believe? After I was sitting on the set saying, even if it's the calf, I think you risk a catastrophic injury because it looked like the Achilles. Then exactly that happens, and now you want me to believe? It's two freak occurrences, completely disconnected. So that was Max Kellerman's take. Which one of those guys is right? Do both of them have some things that are accurate and inaccurate? Well, let's see if we can figure it out. So let's start with the anatomy of the calf. First, what are we talking about when we're referring to the calf? Most people are referring to the backside of the lower leg. In anatomy, the lower leg is called the crust. So therefore, we're going to be exploring the muscles on the posterior aspect of the crust. Now there are actually seven muscles that run through the posterior crust. Let's take a look here. So if you look down at the cadaver here, I can trace these muscles. These are the most superficial muscles that we're taking a look at. The skin's been removed here. And when we're talking about calf strains, people tend to talk about the first muscle here, which is called the gastrocnemius. And this is what I'm tracing with the probe. And you can see I can actually lift it up here. And gastroc refers to belly, gastroc means that. And we're talking about two bellies here. We have a medial belly and a lateral belly of this gastrocnemius. Now, the other muscle that people often refer to in a calf strain is the muscle just deep to it or underneath, which is the soleus. Soleus got its name from looking like a soulfish. You can't see that now, but I'll show you that in just a second. Now, one thing I wanna cover when we're talking about muscle anatomy is when you include the whole muscle, you actually include the meaty portion which is the muscle belly, and then this continues as the tendon. And the tendon connects the muscle belly down to the actual bone. Now, before we get into the functions of this muscle and what it actually does when it contracts, I wanna show you the muscle as it's removed from the cadaver. So this is from just a little bit of a smaller leg, but you can see here the superficial muscle is the gastrocnemius, and I reflect that away underneath it is the soleus. And again, if I flip it over, you can actually see that it does kind of resemble the shape of a fish here. So one more thing to reiterate here again, muscle belly going down to the tendon. Now both of these muscles, the gastrocnemius and the soleus, blend together to form and to actually co go into the Achilles tendon. So one of the things I really like to establish with my students is this relationship with the muscle belly and the tendon. And again, if you take a look down here, they're pretty easy to tell apart. As you can see, the muscle belly is this red, meaty, contractile portion, which is made up of the muscle cells or the muscle fibers. Those are the same thing. And then you can see the tendon is a much different looking structure. And the tendon is actually made out of this tissue called dense regular connective tissue. The reason they named it dense regular connective tissue is because if you looked at this under the microscope, you could see a whole bunch of collagen fibers going in the same direction, parallel with each other. And collagen fibers have amazing tensile strength. So that gives that tendon 
a lot of strength in that one direction of pull there. But we got to look at this and say, okay, how is this attached here at the musculo tendon in this junction? Is the tendon a totally different structure than the muscle belly and they just bind together with some sort of tissue? And the answer is no. Those collagen fibers actually continue in through the muscle belly. And granted, the fibers will change their orientation a little bit, but they'll wrap the muscle fibers or the muscle cells into little bundles called a fasciculus. And then those collagen fibers or connective tissue wrappings continue all the way through the other side of the muscle belly. So when we get back to this discussion of calf strains versus tendon problems and things of that nature, there is a relationship there of those connective tissues being continuous up through the actual muscle itself. So the next thing we have to talk about is the function of these muscles. Or in other words, what do these muscles do to the joints that they cross when they contract? And to help us with this, we have our leg model. So moving down to this area, you guys can see we've got two legs here. These are living legs, as you can see. A little bit different in the cadaver lab today. So what's gonna happen is when this muscle contracts, you can see the muscle belly gets shorter. The tendon actually stays the same length. It's the belly that actually gets shorter, and therefore the tendon has to act on the heel and pull the heel off the ground. We call that action plantar flexion. Now, if we lower down, you can see the muscle belly lengthens and we come back down. The opposite action of plantar flexion, or in other words, when the leg came down, is called dorsal flexion. Now, many of you have probably gone to the gym and done calf raises. So we go up and then we come down. Now, when people come down on a calf raise, it's not like they just drop down. What actually happens is when they come up, the calf is still contracting when they come down slowly. And this is called an eccentric contraction, while the muscle is still contracting, yet it's lengthening. That's different than a passive stretch. Passive stretches, the muscles are lengthening, but they're not contracting. Now, an eccentric contraction, that coming up again, that's a concentric contraction. Coming down is an eccentric contraction. That is really important when it comes to control. And when we talk about calf strains and things of that nature, there's a ton of data that shows when a muscle is strong, especially eccentrically, it can actually help prevent calf strains. And we'll actually see that applies to rehab when we get to the end of this video. So now that we finally have the anatomy out of the way, we can talk about the actual calf strain, the Achilles tendonitis, and the Achilles tendon rupture. Let's start with the calf strain. Calf strain is actual damage to the muscle belly. So imagine these muscle cells or muscle fibers that we're tracing again here getting torn or damaged. Now, in that case, you can sometimes have a mild strain all the way up to a severe strain. They'll often grade it as a grade one strain, grade two, or grade three. Grade one, mild tearing. Grade two sometimes gets referred to as, say, like a partial tear, whereas grade three is a full tear through that muscle belly, which is obviously pretty severe. Now, how do you get these? Well, the data shows that it kind of depends on which muscle is getting the strain. Is it the gastroc or the soleus? The gastrocnemius tends to get strained in more of like an acute phase, like a sudden type of a strain, meaning somebody like you saw in the Kevin Durant video, they're planting and that's eccentrically loading the muscle as it's stretching and then all of a sudden they have to contract and shorten the muscle and that causes tearing in the muscle fibers. Now, the soleus, when it gets strained, that tends to be more of like overuse and chronic use. Maybe somebody's running a lot, doing a lot of heel running and that will overwork those muscle cells and they get torn through overuse. So many of you have probably figured out by now the difference between a calf strain and Achilles tendonitis. Before I go into tendonitis, I just want to mention that many clinicians actually prefer to call it Achilles tendinopathy. And that's because not every patient who has Achilles tendon pain actually has inflammation in the tendon. And so they prefer to use that other term, tendinopathy, rather than tendonitis. Now, in the case of tendinopathy or tendonitis, what is the potential cause? Most cases are due to overuse. And say somebody gets into an exercise program and they overdo it when they jump right into this program, or they just don't allow their tendon to recover through multiple bouts of exercise. Other things that have contributed or been blamed to contribute to tendinopathies or tendonitis of the Achilles is improper footwear, improper mechanics with a gait, sometimes weakening of those posterior calf muscles has also been blamed. But Overuse tends to be one of the common themes that you see with Achilles tendonitis and tendinopathy. 
So the last thing, and obviously the most severe, is the Achilles tendon tear or rupture. And if you just look at the cadaver and actually imagine tearing completely through this structure, that's quite an injury. And that would essentially make the gastroc and the soleus useless in a way. They would try to contract, but if you're torn here, you can't pull the heel off the ground. And a lot of times clinicians will initially do what's called the Thompson test right on the spot, where they squeeze the back of the calf while the patient is on their stomach or prone on a table. And if the heel moves, that actually would indicate that their Achilles is still attached or still somewhat functional. If it doesn't move at all, that gives them a suspicion that the tendon is ruptured. Now, that's not a better test or a replacement test for say like an MRI or imaging, but it does give a clinician an initial idea about what's going on. Now, how does an Achilles tendon rupture typically occur? Now, in that earlier video you saw with Kevin Durant, it's kind of similar to the same mechanism of a calf strain, where you actually have that eccentric loading and that force being placed on the calf muscle and the tendon, and then it has to contract quickly to pull the heel off the ground. A lot of people who have Achilles tendon tears almost feel like somebody kicked them in the back of the heel or the back of the calf, and you often will see them look behind to see if something hit them. Um, and so when you see those videos of people doing that, you'll often see them just actually look back, see if somebody stepped on the back of their foot or their ankle. So finally, back to the original question. Do these three injuries relate to each other in any way? Now, one of those answers is actually pretty straightforward because according to some data, people with Achilles tendon ruptures, 10% of those patients had a previous tendonitis or tendinopathy. So that's a pretty straightforward answer. It doesn't guarantee that you're gonna get an Achilles tendon rupture if you've had tendinopathy prior, but it does put you at a little bit more of a risk. But what about the other two injuries? Does the calf strain relate to the Achilles tendon tear or rupture? Remember, that's how we started. We asked, did Kevin Durant's calf strain relate to his Achilles tendon rupture? Let's just remind ourselves again, remember the Achilles tendon connective tissue, those collagen fibers, continued through the muscle belly. So they do have some connections there as far as the connective tissues being continuous. However, I'm more concerned about the eccentric loading placed upon the muscle. And the muscle, when it eccentrically contracts, absorbs those forces. Imagine that there's a strain and those muscle fibers can't contract as effectively or absorb those loading forces that's done during the eccentric contraction. Those forces have to go somewhere. And in this case, those forces could be placed more upon the Achilles and even the surrounding joints and other connective tissue. He said, if it were a regular season game, would you have played them? The answer would be no. So why would you play them in the finals? Because it's the finals. That's why. So I want to be very, very clear here. Do I think Kevin Durant's medical staff misinformed him? I don't know. I wasn't in those conversations. Personally, if I were Kevin Durant, I would have played. It was the NBA finals. Why wouldn't you play? And I have to say this, I don't think you are guaranteed to get an Achilles tendon rupture if you have a calf strain. The answer is you're more at risk. If those muscle cells can't contract or absorb those forces effectively, those forces may get placed on the tendon. And remember the mechanism of that injury. We're getting this pulling or this loading and loading and loading, and then all of a sudden the muscle is supposed to contract and push that person off the floor. So finally, what are the treatments for those different types of injuries? Well, with the Achilles tendon tear or rupture, most people will go to surgery and they'll reattach the torn tendon. With the calf strain in the Achilles tendonitis or tendinosis, those will share a lot of similar treatment protocols. Many of you have heard of RICE, which is rest, ice, compression, and elevation, and those can help both of those injuries. Compression can be particularly beneficial if there's swelling or in some cases, people may develop a blood-filled swelling in the calf muscle called the hematoma. And again, that compression can help with that. Both of those will also benefit from strengthening the muscles. So if you were to go to physical therapy for this, they may really emphasize certain phases of the contraction. Remember, we talked about eccentric and concentric loading, where concentric was coming up on the toes and then eccentric was slowly lowering down. Now they actually don't really recommend a ton of stretching in say a calf strain, because remember you've damaged those muscle cells and you actually will get the benefit from lengthening the muscles when you do the eccentric phase of that contraction or the eccentric phase of the strength training while you're lowering and lengthening the muscle while it's contracting at the same time. 
And one last thing I want to mention regarding a calf strain, specifically with the gastrocnemius and the soleus. The gastrocnemius actually crosses the knee joint, and so it can actually flex the knee or help you bend your knee, where the soleus doesn't cross the knee, so it won't have any action at the knee. The reason I'm bringing this up is if you have a calf strain on the soleus versus a calf strain on the gastroc, the strength training protocol might be slightly different. To fire into the gastrocnemius, you do calf raises with the leg straight or the knee straight, whereas the soleus, you'd fire into it by doing calf raises with the knee bent. Now, that hopefully can even apply to you guys who are just interesting, interested in increasing strength from an exercise perspective rather than just, say, from a strain perspective. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that video. Check out our description for links for some of the information we used in this video. Also, we always enjoy, like always, posting comments or giving us suggestions of future videos that you may want to see. But until then, we'll see you next time.